Bob's computer. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for coming. And everybody is here, it, people who've been here before, which is very good. I don't have to go into uh, how we're going to arrange this, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so philosophy, I've been thinking about how to uh, define philosophy. Everybody defines it differently. And the way if you define it, I think, is the way that, that you want to do it. So I define it as um, is a look at how we think the world works and our place with it, within it. So if you think about that, it's uh, how we think the world works, not how the world works. How we think it works and our place within it. And that basically sums up, sums up my, the, way, the way I look at the way I look at everything, basically. So um, it's, we usually think of the past as um, ph philosophy, or well, science was once called philosophy. It was, it was all part of the same thing. And we think that uh, after, well, quite a while ago, uh, somebody's coming, that's good. Um, Hang on, Rodney, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I thought this was supposed to be about art. I only turned up here because it was going to be about art. One of the one of the um, rules of this for for quite a while has been that I talk, nobody interrupts me until I say so. Okay? That's why there's only a few of us still here. <laughs> that, for example, is is not allowed. Uh, hi, hi, Melinda. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Thank you. Um, it is about art, but I have to give an introduction. But uh, um, what happened in the beginning that you remember, Maurice, that um, in the beginning I said you can interrupt me when you want, and people did. Within about two minutes of my talking, people leapt at me, and I said, this is going to stop. I have a lot to say, and I never, ever say what I want to say, even when you let me talk. So there will be a break where you can, where you can break me. But that's for, at the moment, I'm talking, and that's it. My lips are sealed. Good. And that's not allowed either. Right. So where was I? OK, so um, I, I, I say uh, no. The split between science and philosophy is not right. Um, in my opinion, the way I see things, it's the same discipline. We examine national phenomena, but from different aspects and angles. Um, that's very, very important to what I'm going to talk today, which is art and the art and the philosophy is part, part of art. And um, we've looked at myriad uh, topics here and they, they've, all, they've all been linking to my points. Uh, we, we talked about physics, we talked about maths and sociology and psychology, language, the self, uh, limits, nothing, time. And, uh, and all of those are part of philosophy as far as I'm concerned. Today, it's about art. And it's art in philosophy, not of philosophy. And it's not the philosophy of art. Now, there are lots of courses about philosophy of art. That's not, that's not why you come here. It's not to hear a lecture. And it's not to hear a lecture and then, and then make comments. This, this, what we do here is we, we do philosophy. I am, I, am the, I am the Socrates who wanders around in white sheets and go up to people and drive them crazy and ask, ask ridiculous questions. And that's, that's basically my function. I'm going to drop bombs and you can pick them up. Hi, Jay. You need to, we need to see you. Jay, can you hear me? Okay, so no, Jay, no. Okay, so um, I'm not going to go through today what philosophers have said about art. That's not interesting. Not not from what from what we do here. All right. Um, I'm just going to just mention very 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 few, just to show you the way the way philosophy and art go together according to some people. For example, Plato uh, said that art. Uh, can never truly represent reality. 
for uh, life itself, of, of which art is merely a copy. So um, it does not represent reality according to Plato. Um, our, our world as we experience it is an illusion, he said. Um, a collection of mere appearances like reflections in a mirror or shadows on a wall. We, uh, hi there, Jay. Hi. Oh, you can hear me. Hi, Isaac. Yes. Good, good, excellent. So um, Kant went at length into uh, aesthetics and judgment of beauty. We will do very little about beauty today. Um, uh, he Hegel, Hegel's account of art incorporates his view of beauty. Uh, he defines beauty as the sensuous perceptual appearance or expression of absolute truth. That's very interesting. The best art works, he said, convey by sensory perceptual means the deepest metaphysical truth. We're going we're gonna to talk about truth tonight. And you, those of you who've been, who've been with me know what I think about truth. So we've got lots and lots of philosophers who went, who went into, into art. Um, De Derrida, who some of you might, have, might know, um, who's a very, very, very difficult, uh, very, very difficult uh, philosopher, or rather very difficult points. And he's, he talked about questions of truth and meaning in painting become questions about truth and meaning in language. And that leads us into an infinite regress of questions that prevent us from ever establishing a solid base from which to make critical pronouncements. That sounds like my sort of bloke or guy anyway. Um, it, in other words, um, philosophers' views on art are inseparable from the complex philosophical systems in which they occur. In other words, uh, what philosophers see in art reflects their basic philosophy. A and that is how you should view my comments today. The things you will hear today, you will uh, recognize, but I'm approaching it in a, from, from the point of, of art. And in fact, the way I look at the world is that you should be able to approach philosophy from, from anywhere be it science, be it art, whatever it is, um, you should be able to get to philosophy. I am not saying that philosophy is simple. It isn't. But you should be able to get to it through whatever it is. And it could be quantum mechanics. And I've, I've done it here before. And it's a, it's a matter of seeing how you think the world works. OK, so. Um, here comes the first big statement. Everything we look at is a translation, everything. Uh, we could um, call it uh, interpretation, but it's a, it's a, it's a translation. Uh, if you look at translation of literature, for example, and that's translated from a foreign language or translated of somebody in the past, Plato or whatever, we, we are, read it in English and the English has, we don't know how much English, English, our language has to do with the original, the original language or even the original thoughts. And, it, and it, it's not only translation from different language because as soon as it leaves somebody, as soon as art is made in any way, it gets to us and we interpret it and we, we translate it into what we think it might be. So um, if we, if we any, any of you, whoever had the fortune or misfortune of reading uh, uh, Heidegger, for example, wrote in German, but, but he was so difficult in, in, Germ in German, so difficult, he um, made up his own vocabulary and, and people were arguing about, about what he said in in German, now you can imagine what it means to translate words that exist in German but were changed to suit him. Imagine what it means to read that from somebody who translated it. Now the person who, who translated it did it according to the way that person saw or thought 
Heidegger was saying it, but he, he might not have done. In fact, he wouldn't have done. I, 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 don't, I don't see how we could possibly read a translation and think that that is what the person actually said, whatever actually said means. Um, and in, in fact, you can read different translations of the same thing and wonder, well, wait a minute, if there are different translations, which one is correct? But of course, uh, uh, knowing me, I, I would say that no, none is, but that is something, something we're going we're, we're gonna to get to. Now, if, if, uh, if, there's, if it's a translation, then there must be something that it was interpreted or translated from. In, in which case we're saying there was an original, and that's hugely pro problematic. An original means the real thing, the perfect thing, the thing. So we're gonna, we're gonna spend some time looking at what the original could possibly mean. Well, I don't think it means much, but, um, but we're, we're gonna touch on many points, okay? Each of which could be extended for, for an hour or so. So we're not going to be here for 15 hours, although sometimes it feels as though we are. But um, but but, but I, I, I will I will drop I will drop things like little bombs, and you will pick them up, and they will they will explode, and and we will, and when I when I stop talking, which will be fairly soon, Maurice, when I stop talking, then you can pick up the bombs and and see and see what. What, what, each, what each means. But um, um, look, some of the bombs will be uh, time or sameness, exactness, reality, illusion, truth, all those easy topics. E each one of them will be a little bomb, a little mine that I will drop and, and you pick it up and, and will explode. I should, of course, um, start with what is art but I know that we won't move past it and I won't because um, uh, we, we will get to it eventually, I suppose. Somebody will ask me what is art and I, I, I won't answer, but that's more or less what I'll be, uh, what I'll be uh, talk, talking about. Uh, it used to be and still largely is a search for, for beauty. Uh, our friend Frank, Frank Shapiro uh, who's actually here with us, we're very honoured, um, that he wrote a very nice little book called Eve and Mary, The Search for Lost Beauty and Sen Sensuality, where in his discussion of, well, he actually starts with, with saying, why is there no woman pope? And from, and from that, he goes on and discusses what men did to beauty and why they, why they discounted it, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you, Frank, for coming and, 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 and listening to us. But, but the, the search for, for, for beauty, I, I'm not sure that that's what's happening anymore. From what, I, from what I see, it's become a search for the bottom turtle. We talked about turtles last time. Uh, it's a search for, search for truth. Okay, so in which way can um, truth be aligned with art? Isn't um, the truth of art, the truth in art, an uh, uh, oxymoron? Doesn't art necessarily bend the truth? It has to, doesn't it? Um, we say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, i.e. it's not objective. So um, what, are, what are we looking for? And art and science, are looking for, supposedly, the hidden real nature of reality itself, to which I say, as you know, there's no such thing. Okay, so do or can we uh, see the world as it is? That's, that's my first big bomb. Or, um, or is it as it is for us? Okay. The world as it is for us, maybe that maybe that's something a bit a bit of a lesser bomb, but but quite a big bomb. Um, well, in that case, we should ask: um, Do do artists see the world at, as it is? Because they're artists, after all. Um, 
as Picasso said, um, art is the lie that helps us see the truth, which is quite nice, except that he mentioned the truth. And uh, Picasso can be wrong as well. And, 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 and let's face it, art is temporary. It will vanish, just like most of the art of bygone years have gone. Ask historians about past art, if they know what past, I mean, how can they know what past art was when it's actually gone? Um, you know, there are more photos taken each day than were in the first hundred years of photography. Art is now on our smartphones, uh, destined to disappear, left on a bus or flushed down the toilet. That's art for you. Are any of those authentic? Uh, are they all authentic since they're all, they're all singular and unique? Is there such a thing as temporarily authentic? Oh, um, now I, I know that some of you are tapping away there and I can see what you're doing, but I can't deal with it. So it's okay to tap away, Richard, but it's, much more, it, no, no, it's much more interesting if we hear it. And I promise you- I'm listening with one ear. <laughs> I can't do that. Um, so um, that's fine. It's fine. But but please keep be, keep the questions so we can hear them because they're all they're all good. Um, okay. So authenticity is one of the things about about art. Um, it's very interesting authenticity because it has a lot to do with money. If something authentic, um, then it's uh, worth something, isn't it? Whatever that means. You know. So uh, Leonardo. So, Salvador Mundi uh, is fighting over its authenticity. It's now worth $450 million. Now, if that's found to be not painted by, by uh, Leonardo, then it's worth nothing. Now, isn't that amazing that you can have something that looks exactly the same in every way, and if it's found to be not written by the, the uh but by the by the artist itself it's worth nothing it, it, i find that i find that strange and we will we will go into that in a minute but can a copy be as good as the original work and why not why not um you know about the 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 vermeer fakes by han van merkenen um that that he painted them so well that 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 um that people and experts were arguing about it, swearing that it's real, and others swearing that, that it's not. Now, why are those less valuable? Or well, we know why they're less valuable, but why are they less good? Maybe, maybe they're actually, maybe they're actually um, better. Um, so, in in essence. In essence, are these questions to be answered, or uh, eventually? Eventually, I'll be, I'll, I need to take notes. Then. Yeah, you do actually, because because I have I I have to get to a certain point, otherwise uh, it's all messed up. So please please bear with me. I I know I told you there are lots of bombs, so I'll give you plenty of time. As this is discussion, you're not supposed to be listening to me. So sorry about that, but um, I will be finished very very soon. Um, Obviously, a, a, um, a forgery is only approximately like the original. Obviously, they cannot be the same. They, they can obviously not the same. But even the original is not the same as itself in time and place. Hold that thought. I will say it again. The original, the one and only is not the same as itself in time and place. So uh, I will get back to that. Um, the leaders of uh, museum and, and, and art gallery world suggested that reproductions should be put up rather than the originals because it will preserve the originals. And uh, why, why not? It would preserve treasures from deterioration or the risk of, of theft. While, uh, while, the, while the public 
can view great works which are deemed too fragile to be displayed. It, 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 get, it gets worse, or actually better, because it's been suggested that technology could give us for the first time the experience the artist intended us to have. That is, showing a painting its original colors, because it fades, so you can, you can enhance them and you're, you're seeing the real thing. Uh, this is, of course, an intriguing concept. The notion that a reproduction can be better than the actual work painted by the artist challenges our belief in the value of authenticity. We, 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 are, really, we are really messing with our, with our minds here. Um, the philosopher Walter Benjamin wrote that even the most perfect reproduction lacks one key element, and that's an answer to my question, one key element of the original, i.e. its presence in time and space, its unique existence at the place where it happens to be. Well, um, far be it for me to argue with dead philosophers, but they're the only ones who can't argue back, so it's all right. Um, that what he said is uh, true to a certain extent, um, and not true to a to a greater extent. Um, everything is unique. Everything is unique. Having said that, having said that, I must add that its presence in time and space is changing continuously. Even the original work changes every time we look at it. It never has a unique experience per se. Its existence is unique only in the sense that no two things are the same, i.e. they always, always change. Now, when we look at a painting today and we look at it tomorrow, we will look at it differently. It will have changed not, in, not only the... The molecules, the atoms are changing, which is physical, but the fact that we, that we see something in a different mood, in a different place, in a different location, closer or further away, seeing it, uh, seeing it closer means we see it uh, faster to us, and we see it differently from somebody uh, standing next to us. We, I, I must say that nothing is ever the same a second time, ever. Okay, so um, the subject, the art critic, and the object, the work of art, leaves neither unaffected. The critic changes art, and art changes the critic. And now, just to, just to get Terry warmed up very slightly, um, uh, quantum mechanics and, uh, has the observer effect ostensibly. All right, um, that um, in which every measurement of a particle changes it, i.e., causes a wave function to collapse. It, the, 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 the very ostensibly, the very measurement changes changes what is actually happening. Okay, so if we look at it from the point of view of relativity, we could also say that it changes the measurer, the one who's doing the the measuring would change as well by seeing something happening uh, in, in front of him, his perception. So both are changing relative to each other, i.e. A, a dynamic relationship with each other. My last question before you can all let loose, um, does the intention of the artist matter? Does the intention of the measurer in science matter? on quantum mechanic, does it matter? Once we could say that once the art is out there, it ceased to belong to the artist, to the creator, but it never belonged to the artist since it depends on our interpretation of what we see. It never, never belongs to him. It belongs, it belongs to everybody else and not to him ever because I, I um, his view of what he did is doing is changing is changing uh, uh, as well. Um, but by the way, something very interesting. I don't know if any of you do it, but when I go to to look at um, paintings, I always 
I always look at the label to see what it's supposed to be, which is crazy. I am not satisfied until I know that that line is, is Madonna and child, for, for example. I'm not, I'm not satisfied until I see what the bloke, what the artist meant, which is crazy. I should be looking at it and saying, oh, that's interesting. But even if they're dots or whatever it is, I'm, I want to see, I want to see what, what, he, what he meant. And uh, what he meant is might uh, obviously helps me, but uh, but that's that's a uh, that's a that's a pity. Um, so how can we disagree with an artist who says that two lines represent mother and child, if that is the way he sees it? Can we can we argue with him? Sh should we? It, if I ask you to think of um, dog, for example, what do you see? Obviously something different to what I see. Now we're into, of course, the thing in itself, Kant, me and objectivity. What is it that we see when we look at something? What is it that we see when somebody else mentions something? So um, an, an example of, uh, of relativity, something I'm dealing with at the moment, um, does the earth go around the sun or vice versa? Copernicus said that the Earth, the Earth is going around the, around the sun. This was not accepted for a long, long, long time. It's true, and it's also not true because if you go further out, you, uh, you'll be wondering what is actually going around what in relativity. And now, since I've been talking for a long time, I will now have a very short break. I mean, I won't have a break, but I will now stop talking. You can pick up the, the minds, ask questions, and uh, have, have a go at me. If not, I carry on talking. I'm warning you. Well, do you want to start with whatever your first question was and go through the list of questions, and we'll all try and uh, answer or give our own ideas about those. If you think I remember I mean, what I did first, you're mistaken. Well, I think you've got them written. I think you've got them written down. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Okay. When you first started, you said something about your own definition of um, philosophy. Now, if I remember correctly, it seemed to me that that could have also been a definition of early religion when they were trying to make sense of the world about them and they took um, personification of nature, for instance, and made it into a sun god or a thunder god or whatever, um, when they thought that if they did certain rituals, they would have an effect on the world. And these rituals would mean that um, the, the crops came up or the rains came or whatever. Now, the fact that there was no scientific evidence because science hadn't come along doesn't stop it being the way that you defined it, which is why so many people can go around with um, being, if you like, anti-science and anti-philosophy because they're not rational in their beliefs, but they believe that certain um, concepts uh, are legitimate and it's the way the world works. So they believe that there's a God there that is um, doing everything and that you should or shouldn't have abortions for women in America, um, that you should, I mean, things that even if there were a God, I can't imagine any divine being would give a damn about it. Then to go on about art and philosophy being the same, I am aware of the idea. And yes, there are cross currents but do you remember Keats' poem about Lamia or Lamia? Um, in some ways, art is beauty, if you like, whereas philosophy is rationality and logic. And if you remember, the philosopher there eventually dismisses the beautiful serpent or beautiful woman, whichever you prefer to take Lamia to have been. Um, in some ways, art is glamour. Uh, by glamour, I mean in the sense of magic. Uh, what's the um, the Indian word for it? Uh, illusion, anyway. Whereas philosophy and science, because philosophy and science were conjoined, um, are ways of finding rational explanations for what the earth is. 
The fact that people think they're being rational doesn't mean they are. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> uh, in, in fact, could I comment on that? Definitely. Uh, Richard, you're way too nice to scientists, way too nice. <laughs> yes. Um, and I say that as a scientist because uh, to say that scientists do not have principles of faith upon which they apply is precisely the reason why science can get itself so incredibly hosed and needs philosophy to shake our stupid little heads loose a little bit to look at what we're talking about. Because a lot of times people just, I'll give you a simple example. Uh, you've all heard of space time and Minkowski and all of the, you know, Einstein, space time is actually Minkowski, not Einstein. If you read his paper, he does the following little trick. He says, let us assume there is an infinite expanse of substance in all ways in space and time. What he did with that one sentence as a faith premise said, well, there's no particles, just everything's infinitely long. There's these giant stringy things that go to eternity. Therefore, eternity exists. Therefore, all this exists. There was not a shred of science in any of that. He literally introduced this idea in one sentence. That was it. He gave no background for it. He was trying to shake Einstein loose from Hume because he didn't like Hume, Einstein did, and he succeeded. He shook him loose from Hume and Einstein backed off from his resolute pursuit of individual reality and went off to this space time that doesn't exist out of a substance that doesn't exist and out of all sorts of things that doesn't exist. So- Can't other scientists, can't other scientists fals falsify that though? I mean, that's the whole idea behind Popper's view about what, the what, scientific what, methodology. What happens is instead of falsifying it, they rationalize it because you can falsify Minkowski's idea by quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics came along a few years later and instantly made it impossible to get the mass of a particle because quantum uncertainty grabs different links to this thing. But try to explain that to somebody who's used to grew up with all this idea as a faith premise inside of the science uh, discipline. It's extremely hard to, to point it out because their minds will say, but that can't be right because that's what I was taught. Because I was taught that it has to be right. It has to be exactly right. And uh, it just as in a faith premise, you have, the, you have this thing that becomes extremely unsettling to question something that fundamental. And that particular premise, as sketchy as it was and how it got introduced, is so deep into the fabric that people can't get around to it. And what this has to do with art, I have no idea. Uh, so so let, me, let me get, but, but I, I just did want to put that in, that I, I, I seriously think one of the problems with, with science is that, uh, and I, I say there's some of that, is we have to question our foundations uh, profoundly at times and say, does this make any sense? And if to get it back a little more on track, I think art as, as well as philosophy is a part of that. I don't agree with this idea that art's completely separate from science. I think there is an art to good science because science is not as deterministic as we think it is on many points. Now, yes, there's foundation issues that we try to understand them, we don't have much control over it. But to think that there is no, you know, everything is predetermined and that's it, somehow the Encyclopedia Britannica, which is kind of old these days, but you know, it just, it just was pre-programmed into this world fabric that Minkowski came up with and just happened to be there. Tell me how that's not a faith premise. <laughs> you know, that's, you just say it, all this stuff just, it, it just happened to be there and now, now we're just going through time. Doing, yeah, come on. Uh, there's a creative aspect to all of this. And, and if we don't recognize that, we don't recognize that we're doing art every time we talk about something, some idea, we're gonna miss out on some possibilities, uh, a lot of them. So I think an artistic aspect needs to be appreciated in all of our pursuits, not just, not just, not just art. I think art is, I think of art as one of the pinnacles of human achievement, you know, and I'm the guy who's a scientist. But I, I have just enormous respect for good artistic endeavors because I think they're really showing what is possible and what, what could be. I've talked enough. No, no. Uh, uh, Richard, you showed incredible bias and um, uh, irras irrational 
irrationality in your rationality. Okay, explain. <laughs> because point by point, explain. <laughs> because you came out with stuff like uh, it, it, if there had been here, there isn't. I know, but if there would be a religious person here, he would say to you, "I don't know what you're talking about." I mean, it rationally there is a god. I know there is because I can see all the wonderful things. And how could this have happened without it? He would explain to you very, very rationally, and I've heard it. Now, you don't think it's rationality, but that's your bias. And he... He would, he would deny the rationality of <coughs> Hindu having many gods um, or an interpretation of God that was different from his view of God because he believes in a faith. Uh, yes. So yes, therefore, it is not one view of the divine, it is many views of the divine, depending on which religion you belong to. Now, I put them all in a superstition, but I, <laughs> one, can't, one can't actually say that. It's just that I, I prefer to sort of um, get under the skin because I find religious people tend to dislike atheists and agnostics. I respond. Uh, I agree that that is not um, totally rational one would have to say one can't tell but i am absolutely sure that the way that um deities are viewed by people old men with white beards like us or some of us um is anthropomorphic and that if there was such a thing then we would need to study it in a scientific way and put it in a lab and pull it to pieces and see what it was made of and also it would probably have very little to do with us. Um, uh, sorry, Frank. M Melinda, yes. Next, Frank. Hi. Hi, Melinda. Um, I'm in uh, the West Coast of the United States, so I keep losing um, the thread of things, but this is fascinating to me. I'm an artist and uh, not much of a philosopher, but a bit. So someone correct me, I think it was Gadamer perhaps that uh, talked about the horizon of history. Um, and so I think in this discussion of um, the speaker just then, Richard, I think said, I'm not, I'm absolutely certain of something. And- I'm not certain of anything ever. Oh, you're <laughs> absolutely not certain. Excellent, because uh, as an artist, I do believe um, what influences the work of any civilization, any culture, is the horizon of history in which they find themselves um, and what seems real and what uh, insights one gathers from seeming real. So. I am not uh, very convinced that there is truth, an ultimate truth, an ultimate decision of things. Um, Terry and I exchanged a moment of science um, when we started talking about um, mirror neurons. Why, Ron, you, you suggested the question, why do we react? Um, to aesthetics, aesthetic expressions. And I suggested them that mirror neurons may play a role in why we react to things. So I think the, the question of no, art is not a, an existential question of what is the true definition of art. I think the definition of a reaction to one's time in the world and the realities that exist in the world uh, and creating some kind of um, responsive expression of that in whatever media one suggests one is attracted to is the aesthetic of art. I don't think that there is a single answer. Uh, and now I think I'm almost done. Now I, th I think of Banksy and whoever the group that may be Banksy. Banksy may not be an individual at all, but certainly is that artistic? I think anyone would call it artistic um, because it's a, an expression of a reaction to the stimuli that we're exposed to. Um, I also think about the great archeology span experiments and um, discoveries that have happened since LIDAR was um, created. 
and that is the tie-in of science and art, one of them. So, so I think it's, it's a little bit um, not very useful to ruminate on what is an absolute definition. I think what is more interesting, at least to me, to ruminate on is why do we see things the way we do? Why do we express them the way we do? What are the stimuli and the influences along with the thoughts that um, occur to us to make an expression that could be abstract or could be, I, I put in the chat uh, recently, um, uh, conservators discovered in the Vermeer painting, the big, huge Cupid behind the woman looking out the window, uh, reading apparently a love letter, um, which changed the interpretation of that particular piece of art because there was more information to be had. I don't think it necessarily means that other people reacting to that art had the wrong idea. They just had an idea that was the stimulation, uh, the, the experience of, of an artistic expression and what that quote means. So if I find this very interesting because even our language re, you know, reflects this, um, uh, uh, I, you know, being a, a lifelong feminist, I noticed how many times Ron, and I'm appreciating your talk, but how you refer to he as the absolute that he, he says this and he says that. Um, and they is preferred in the United States at this point because the United States is struggling at this point with trying to uh, recognize the exclusionary nature of society in our past and in our current and see what we can do about that. Uh, on our own individual and as artists, what we can do on an artistic uh, level too, to try to reach into to people's mirror, mirror neurons and reach into people's quote, um, symbolic hearts and reach into quote, God um, and see what the unities may be. Okay, that's, that's my lecture back from- oh, no, uh, Portland, Oregon. No, it's Hi. Great. Hi, you guys. Thank you very much. I, I'm delighted there's an artist here to, who can uh, who can put me in in my place, etc. Thank you. That very 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 interesting points. I I will not uh, <laughs> I, I will not say anything about what you said about he. Okay, I am using he as a generic they, and. Um, but I won't go into that because we're going to have an argument. But I mean, because I, I, when I say he, I don't think of he. I think of, I think of it's the it's the word I use because it's in in all languages. It's the it's the fallback position, and I know why. It's okay, and it, it it's fine. But but since I, mean, I use it, not meaning anything bad, and 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 I, and I I I find it. I have to say this. I have to say this although I shouldn't, I find it extremely annoying when I read, and this happens all the time, when they talk about the scientist, she. And, and this seems to be so false. It's such a poke in the eye to say she for a scientist instead of he, because, because it, it, it's, it's bringing up something that, that, that people don't think about. When, when I say a scientist, he, I don't mean scientist he, I mean a scientist. But if I say she, then I'm pushing something onto everybody and I don't mean to. Do you see what I mean? I, I'm, I'm not arguing with you. I'm just, I'm just saying how, how it, it bothers me personally, but I might be the only one in the world who it bothers. So please excuse me for saying that. But, but I'm very pleased that there's an artist here and you made some very, very good points. And the next one, thank you. But, it doesn't mean you can't talk again just because you spoke and you didn't speak for long. It was fine. It was excellent. Thank you. Uh, I think next was Frank. Frank, can't hear you. Good 
you hear me now? Yes, well done. Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like to address two issues. Number one, you spoke about um, copies of uh, paintings. What, why can't people accept uh, a copy as good as the original if it looks like the original, right? Well, uh, wouldn't you say that the person who buys an original or hopes he's buying an original is really trying to find a kind of an emotional attachment with the actual painter? I mean, if you have an original of Leonardo da Vinci, then you find that you have some really special association, however you interpret it, of course, subjectively, that you really have a closeness of proximity with Leonardo da Vinci. If you have a, a representation of a picture of Leonardo da Vinci, you haven't got the closeness to Leonardo da Vinci. And therefore, I think the whole business of people wanting to get as near as possible to uh, originals is because of the, the need, the emotional need to be with the artist. That's just a, a personal take on that. Secondly, I'd like to say every um, period in history approach, um, really approaches art in a different manner. I mean, the early Greeks, Seeing the, that man is the, is the center of everything, they decided to see the beauty in the human potential, in the human body. And therefore, they, the philosophers matched up beauty with art and presented it in its full glory. That's why we have these beautiful uh, uh, sculptures of, uh, of Greek and Roman art. And then, of course, if we go on to the... Uh, Middle Ages, then we lose what is art for art's sake, which was in the Greek Roman period. People love to paint and to, to, to create beautiful creations. But in the Middle Ages, the church decided that they're going to do away with the art for art's sake, and they looked at art differently. Art for them was instructive, it really taught an illiterate population how to really receive the dictates of the church. And therefore art for them had a different meaning, had a different philosophy. And then we can go on and on. If we look at the Eastern Christian world of the icons, the religious icons, people used art in order to get close to God, to meditate on a picture of the saints or of Jesus or of Mary, etc., etc in order to find a closeness with the divine, a sort of mysterious proximity. And therefore, I would say that we can't generalize when we, when we talk about philosophy in art. We have to decide what period we're talking about and what is the approach to art, because each period has its different philosophy towards art, more or less. That's what I have to say. Yes, that's, that's right. Uh, OK. Um... That's a good point. I was going to make that. That's a good point. Um, but Bill, you've got your hand up. Yes. The way I read Kant, he is suggesting that there's a difference between an a priori idea that we project on data. And I think what Terry was saying is that those a priori ideas are articles of faith, that they configure our experience. And I go back to what you were saying, uh, Ron, about seeing. Now, there's a very interesting writer named Grombrich who says that we don't see as artists, rather we use projections of paradigms that are figurative and that we construct our art based on those configurations. In other words, those configurations are a priori ideas that we integrate into a canvas. And so for that reason, I think there is a big difference between a canvas that is created as a original piece because it involves the application by the artist of a paradigm to something he was inspired by versus a copy which is an echo and an echo is certainly not the same in terms of challenge in terms of accomplishment as an original idea and so for that reason the difference between echo and original is important to me and devalues the echo as something that is a knockoff and then lastly, I think the issue of whether we have uh, 
uh, a paradigm in play in all of these other issues is the same. I think there is a paradigm involved in science. I think there are paradigms involved in all the activities that we have and certainly in religion. And the configuration that we project on them is an idea that we have in our heads and the data that we use to configure them are the, are, 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 are the outside stuff that comes in from somewhere else. Anyway, those are ways I think of looking at this issue in terms of the difference between a priori ideas and data. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I just want to point out that the, or rather bring forward the notion of a copy and why a copy is inferior to a the original, a copy could be very, very much better, in, in which case it's not a copy. I don't think that anything is a copy. Anything. Well, let, me say this. let me say this. I think there's a difference between the issue of production and how it happens. And in that case, there's a difference between a copy, which is an echo, and an original, which is a much more undertaken task that is more contingent in the case of the artist than it is if you're making a copy, which is a fixed data piece that you knock off. And I think that in terms of the aesthetic impact, on the other hand, as distinct from the production part, the aesthetic part may be enhanced in the copy. We may have a much more vivid aesthetic experience. We may get the image and get the message. We may get the impact that the artist wanted in more vivid ways. But I'm just saying there is a distinction there that I think makes a valuation issue clear. And if an artist does uh, copies his own original painting, how would you, how would that be? That he's still, he's, then he's echoing, he's plagiarizing himself. So the first one is worth more than the second one? No, it's different. Okay. I don't have a value issue. I just say it's a production difference. Okay. And it, there is greater esteem in the original because it was a process of discovery rather than knockoff. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Okay, I'm going down the top now. Um, Morris, you're in line, and then Roland. Uh, I fear I'm going from the sublime to the ridiculous, but nevertheless, here goes. I sat watching a film on television the other day. Uh, it was uh, called The Great Escape. It was an old British film about how some uh, British uh, officers uh, managed to tunnel their way out of a German prison camp uh, during the Second World War. And I'm watching Charles Bronson uh, in a tunnel underground. Uh, he can't can hardly breathe. He's tunneling away with his hands and he's being pushed forward on a little trolley in this, in this tunnel. Uh, uh, he can't even get onto his knees. He's absolutely flat. I couldn't breathe from the tension and the feeling that I was with him there inside that tunnel. And then all of a sudden I realized that the, to film this, the camera was moving along the tunnel with him. In fact, the tunnel has, was missing one wall, one side, in order for us <laughs> to see what he was doing in the tunnel. And of course, he could at any moment, I realized, have stuck his hand out of the tunnel. He could have just rolled over and been out of it and into the studio and gone in seconds. And there I was looking at the television screen and saying, saying to myself, I am believing absolutely and completely in two uh, totally opposite, contradictory situations. One is this poor man's in the tunnel and he can't breathe. And the other is uh, that there's a film studio where they are making a, a, a dramatic film out of this. And it made me understand that whenever I look at art, in this case, it's cinematic art, but it could be any other art I think that you can think of. Uh, what we're doing is practicing that, uh, that feature of our humanity, of our human consciousness, which enables us to believe in two or even more contradictory, even uh, uh, self, uh, even, even uh, things that deny each other 
uh, existence uh, at the same one and the same time and by this means uh, we managed to live our lives we couldn't do we couldn't uh, go to sleep at night without full confidence that in the morning we're going to wake up and the sun is going to shine except of course maybe tomorrow morning i won't wake up and the sun won't shine but they and these two things are equally but uh, I, I believe them equally equally strongly and i can only do that because uh, i have a human consciousness and i see i, I think art uh, as i see it is uh, an expression of this strange ability that we have and we keep practicing how we do it all the time we have to refine our ways of doing it so that we can be uh, more uh, efficient human beings using our consciousness to the full um, that's all i wanted to say at this point anyway i think you i think you've read the book i haven't written yet <laughs> ah that's the book i haven't written yet but you haven't read <laughs> Now I, I'm very, I'm, I'm very, very much uh, for um, the di dichotomy. I think it's absolutely part of our, part of our humanity. This, uh, the complete two things that are fighting each other, and I, I definitely agree with you there. Uh, it, it, it happens sometimes, Maurice. We do agree. It, and now, well done. Um, ah, Roland, yes. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I, I, I quite resonated with what Morris had to say, uh, but I think I'd like to take it to a further extreme. Um, and maybe one example would be to, about the, uh, the idea of the original and the copy. And what I would say here is there is no original and there is no copy. Um, and so it's impossible to make, a, to make a comparison or distinguish between them. The reason why there's no original and no copy is because the um, experiences of those things occur within people. Uh, the, uh, the experience I might have of an original painting will not be the same as someone else's. Uh, the experience I might have of a copy will not be the same as anyone else's. So the point I'm making here really is that uh, the key thing is how the individual reacts to the influence of art or anything, in fact. And it is that reaction that um, gives them the ability to assess value according to their particular uh, criteria, their particular way of seeing it. So um, one of the things that Bill said um, uh, kind of uh, rattled me a little, um, which was that uh, some, uh, well, the, he didn't actually say it, it was, it, I, I felt it might possibly have been implied that there was something intrinsically different between an original and a copy. I can't agree with this because uh, if someone doesn't know the difference and they're presented with a copy and uh, they react to that copy as if it is an original, who is to say that there is a difference? Who is to say that that original has impacted differently from the copy? Well, certainly not the person who has been deceived because they are behaving as if it is the original. So on that level, in terms of making a distinction between, uh, a, you know, in terms of authenticity, I don't think we can actually attribute that to the, the thing in itself. We have to attribute it to how the individual perceives that thing. And I think this, there's another angle here which I felt was um, quite useful to mention. And that is the difference between uh, an idea, talking about an idea, for example, the idea of something being original, the idea of something being a copy, and the implementation of that idea in some way. To me, it seems that there is a staggering difference between an assertion and having an experience of that assertion happening. Um, to, to my mind, that's the, very, that's the very reason why we have science. We have the ability to formulate any assertion we like. So I can say elephants can fly, and I can also say um, 
Paris is in France. And there is structurally no difference between the, the language I'm using. The, 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 in the absence of any evidence, one could say, um, there is no way of telling whether either of those statements are true or false. The only way in which a statement of, or any assertion can be given any, uh, you could say truth value for the want of any better expression, is by somehow implementing that information and getting an experience. Now, ultimately, I feel that all of our um, evaluations, all of our understandings, all of our judgments come from this, this mysterious quality that I have just called experience, but we might call consciousness, we might call, well, there's dozens of words for it, aren't there? But uh, that to me is the baseline or the base, uh, the baseline that I've got, certainly. When I think to myself um, about my reaction to objects, to things, to people, to art, to music, um, I can't conceive of the idea of those of those reactions existing independently of me. That, that makes no sense at all. And I can't see how anyone else can think that because it just, it, that makes no sense. And therefore I cannot see how those things can have intrinsic value in themselves. So um, I suppose what, to sort of summarize what I'm saying is this is very much about how we are influenced by experiences how they affect us. And speaking for myself with art, I'm not really that interested in why the author, um, you know, why the artist created it or um, anything like that, because I'm not sure the artist actually knows. To my mind, uh, the key thing about art is that it impacts upon me and it creates um, an influence and it has the capacity to create a change in me in some way or to illuminate something in me that I might not otherwise be aware of. And uh, that is the case for being an artist. too. I'm not a painter, but I write a lot of poetry. And I'm very well aware that when I write poetry, I often have no idea what I'm going to say. And when I do say it and I read it, I'm often affected by it in a way that I wouldn't have expected. I see something that that I've written that triggers something in me. And uh, uh, the same is true of music. I compose stuff as well. And uh, when I do that, I often have no idea what I'm about to play. And yet when I do play it, I can feel, uh, what I would describe it as is a feedback current. It's like tapping into a feedback current um, where one is expressing and receiving and expressing and receiving at the same time. It's like a stream of feedback. So that's the way I experience art. And um, to my mind, identifying how it is of value or whatever, that may be important to some people. To me, I'm more interested in how it affects me um, because I'm not really sure I've got anything else. <laughs> anyway, there we are, that's my two cents. That makes that makes a lot of that definitely makes a lot of sense with your two cents definitely and um, yes it's what I mentioned about uh, uh, art affecting the artists and artist affecting the art it's a continual uh, playback uh, it happens all the time with everything that happens to us uh, what is happening to us here is affecting us and we're affecting other people who are watching and li listening to us. And when we think about it tomorrow, it will affect us again and differently because time has passed. And that, that, is, that is art. I definitely agree that uh, the problem with um, uh, an original piece is a problem to me also. That uh, I, don't, I don't know. Original means, means the thing, the, the thing that we're supposed to look at. But the thing has, has disappeared long ago. It disappeared as soon as the as soon as the artist brings it out. It it's become a copy of a copy of a copy. As far as I I agree with you there. There there are there are hands up. I don't know if they're still up or they're. Um, Bill, is your hand up because it's up or you forgot and to put I it down? I just wanted to say oh, you yeah. know, that 
the idea of a suspension of disbelief is kind of the core of a, an aesthetic reaction to a piece that is there regardless of how it's produced. It can have the impact that's being discussed in a powerful way as a copy or a copy of a copy. But I think there's a three perspectives that we have to keep in mind is the audience perspective, which is the aesthetic experience of confronting the piece and having a whole host of emotional reactions, projections and feelings and evoking our histories and all that. And the idea that we are a critic who is trying to dissect and analyze the piece and then the production process by the artist that is maybe ineffable. And I, I, I think all three have to be considered if you want to get a full appreciation of the context of art. Terry, I have to ask you to, to say that out loud. I just caught it. The definition of original. I can't hear you. Okay, yeah, I had to unmute it. Um, you're very naughty because you're you're saying things that, that we can't I, hear, and it, it was good, and we want to hear it. I know, I know. I, I, at the same time, you don't want to interrupt in, on the middle of uh, the folks talking, but uh, what I'll just read out aloud what I said. Uh, here's a different definition of original. That which introduces a thought or feeling that no one has ever felt before, not even the artist. It's a new formulation. It may be based on old uh, feelings of things that people, uh, reactions people are familiar with, but there's something genuinely novel about it. And, and to me, that's incredibly important because, I, and this is why I think art is so important because in good science, same thing. You have to have some formulation that's never quite been thought of before. That's some way of looking at it, it's different. Look at the quantum revolution in the twenties. My, go my goodness, the perspectives were so different from anything before that that they were art. They weren't just an inside. They were just a whole different way of looking at things. So yeah, but, I think uh, but, um, Can I just um, ask you something about that? Is there such a thing that nobody's ever thought of before? Don't we all uh, stand on the, um, on the shoulders of giants? I mean, quantum mechanics did not come from nowhere. Yes, and yet at the same time, there is some kind of a threshold that gets crossed where suddenly what was accepted before is this has to be, this must be, that's the way it is, uh, it gets broken. And when it gets broken, uh, often in a flood of different things come out. This whole issue about copying, that is partly what made me think of this, what Roland was saying is that, uh, why do people copy it? Because they see that novelty and they want to have a piece of it but they're just making a copy. So they're getting some nuance of it. Sometimes the nuances might go into their own creation of that. But I think the, the very reason why people try to copy good art is because it does provide something different, provide something that's new, that adds a, to the human experience, to novelty, to insight. And I think without that, you don't really uh, have a desire to make copies of it. So the copy is, you know, the, the imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. And the flattery, I think in this case, is of the, of the originality of it. Uh, why did the Harry Potter series get so popular? You know, there's how many kids books have been written? It, you could argue that just that it was, you know, just a fluke, but I, I think in some ways it was the artistry of, of just combining some set of characters and settings that just resonated with people and resonated with our culture in a way that was unexpected and was novel. Many good songs, there's how many good songs are out there? It's just an unbelievable number of good songs. How many of them actually resonate with the entire world and suddenly become a hit for the world? Part of it's marketing, part of it isn't. Part of it is just something that somehow captures a, a, a gestalt that just for, that, that, that people, resonate with. I use the word resonate. I can't think of a better word for it, but somehow it, 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 it hit, hits your head and, and makes your, your brain go like, oh, I get that. Whereas the noisy stuff doesn't, you know, and, and that's me. It, no, you know, people say noise creativity. That's nonsense. Creativity is something really hard, really tricky, and it, it requires some construction. I gave the analogy in the, the comments also about programming which to me is kind of demeaning because programming is kind of a boring, dull thing, but nonetheless, there, there's, there's that aspect to it. There's, there is thought, there is construction, there's building, you're communicating. You're not just throwing out things at random. 
unless that actually is part of the message that can happen too. But it, it, uh, it has to have enough structure to it that is connecting you with other people in some interesting fashion. Melinda, I'd love to hear what you have to say in some of this. Who, who is that? Who Thanks. Are... I, I'm oh. putting a lot of stuff that I think in the chat, um, and I'm not going to talk because other people have their hands up. So, no, uh, no, Melinda. Seems... No, no, yeah. we want to hear you, Melinda. We do want to I... hear you. Yeah, Can... but I, I can wait. I can okay. wait. Okay. There's... I will answer that. Um, and Good. I, I can wait. Stop typing. We're, we're waiting with bated breath. I've got to get to others who haven't yet talked. We're going to come back to you definitely. I, I think it's one of we, we have an artist with us. Uh, okay, Debbie. Yeah, yes. Well, Hi. let me just say that I think, Terry, what you said is right on. And I actually think it is very, quote, scientific in the sense of uh, experiential that I do believe that mirror neurons and, and the vibration of um, huh, art, color, um, sound, movement, that actually does hey. Melinda, are you still there? Hello. And there I went again. Um, you know, it takes a while for the West Coast uh, <laughs> of America to uh, catch up with the vibration. But ter Terry, I think the experience is, I think what's fascinating in a field of scientific study, which is why as an artist, I'm so interested in, in the science of communication, is what is the vibratory nature that actually um, shakes shapes, I don't know what the verb might be, um, the experience of other to even, even static pieces of what we call art or um, physically moving like dance. Why do people go to dance? Why does a certain tune grab you? Why if you hear, if, if, if a, a sentient human and dogs and plants hear a certain vibratory pattern, why do they react? Um, and why, why do people smile? Why do we, you know, why does a certain movement make someone smile? What is that, that physicality, reactionary, biochemical, um, vibratory influence that can get people dancing in time with each other. Why do we want to? Why do we want to dance with each other? Why have we done that since the beginning of history that we can examine? Um, for me, these are, these are experiences that I've had that have drawn me to the questions, not the other way around. Uh, it, in my world, I don't have the question first. I have the experience and the expression of the experience first, which then leads me to questions of why. But when you were speaking of um, someone was was talking about um, the movie and being on the cart, you know, I, I put in the chat at that. This is this is the gods telling me to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, Melinda, I, I love the way your your kind of startled looking face pops on whenever you you go out for a second. There, it's just sort of like wakes us up a little bit. <laughs> wait, wait, come back, come back to me, all oh, Britishers, come back to me. I wonder what Debbie and Richard have to say. Yeah, I Debbie. wonder what Debbie has to say. <laughs> yeah, Debbie? Yeah, I'll try. I'll do my best. Um, I wanted to uh, address um, Roland's and Ron's theory, um, what you um, 
uh, just outlined, uh, Roland, about the uh, effect that th there's no actual difference between origin and copy or original um, artifact or, or, or piece of art. And the copy, because it depends, if I understand correctly, uh, because it actually what is important is how you experience these two uh, different uh, pieces of art, whether one is authentic or not. The difference is whether you, as the human, uh, reacts to it. it. Is that true? So the, that is why uh, the, the question whether a piece of art is original or not is not an important question to ask or a not relevant question to ask. And, and then I'm thinking uh, that with that theory, with this assumption that the human is part of art, I'm wondering whether, um, what about the piece of art itself? And that does have to do with the uh, origin because unless we uh, believe that um, things just appeared in the world, it has to have a creator. So I'm wondering whether the, the human, the creator of the piece of art, it has to be a human. Uh, unless, we're not talking about beautiful natural um, phenomena, but we're talking about man and woman made uh, pieces of art, then doesn't the artist, the creator, the maker of that art have, um, have um, relevance and importance in the way the art affects you or whether um, the uh, intentional uh, expression of the artist is not important to what the origin is. Um, so doesn't the perspective of the human have anything to do with how we can also relate to the art? Let's say um, as you, you said you were um, you're writing poetry and uh, perhaps you do have intentions to how or why you've written the meaning and perhaps you don't and perhaps I would come and read it and would have perhaps a completely different interpretation to what you meant. And then I'm thinking, uh, does my interpretation have um, truth in it? Does it matter? Or perhaps it does matter if you did have specific intentions in this uh, create in that creation and doesn't that have uh, importance? in the way that uh, somebody ex uh, experiences the origin and the copy. So perhaps the origins does have a difference. It's the, the creator's expression that has something to do with, I, I don't wanna call it the thing itself, but in the creation, in the thing that you are experiencing. So I'm thinking that your theories about the human is not only about, or I would perhaps could um, uh, extend it to not only the perceiver, but also to the creator. Also the creator is a perceiver. And does he and she or they have um, meaning in origin? And then therefore it is important to talk about an original piece as opposed to um, a copy. Just, just in the fact that there's the human expression that made that piece of art into being. That's, that's I don't know if that's a question or <laughs> and uh, why I saw the other side perhaps of what you were saying. Would you like me to answer some of those Yes, points? please. Uh, Yes, because <clears throat> I think I might have some uh, response to that. I suppose um, 
the first thing I would say is uh, if we're considering uh, how someone is impacted by a work of art, the first thing we perhaps have to ask ourselves is where that evaluation is located. Where is it? Um, as far as I can see, it emerges in the consciousness of the perceiver of that piece of art. Um, so uh, the very fact that someone recognizes that something is art uh, surely has to happen in the person who is recognizing it. I can't see how it can happen anywhere else. I certainly agree that if someone is told this is a work of art, then that obviously will affect them as well. And if someone is told this is the original and this is a copy, then that will affect them as well. But whether they value the original over the copy or the copy over the original will depend upon how those things influence them and how they weigh up the values. So uh, I guess what I'm really saying is that the actual, the process of evaluating that, um, uh, that question must be happening somewhere. And it seems to be happening in the perceiver of the art and not in the creator of the art. So, I mean, there may well have been lots of art created in the past that no one even knows there's art, you know, um, because, because they haven't registered that it was, it had any artistic intent behind it. So that was um, one point. Another point, which is possibly a bit more obscure, I don't know, is the question of intent. Now I've, um, in my kind of discussions with people, I've yet to discover um, any evidence at all for free will. So I'm starting on the platform of, uh, I do not understand this concept of free will. So when we come to think about the idea of intent, we, we, we use language every day, like we're making something happen, we're doing this, as if we have the ability to make decisions between one thing or another. I don't really see this. Um, so when we talk about intent, what are we talking about? Are we talking about um, something that the artist conceives of some great idea and then goes ahead and does it? Or um, actually, is the artist actually unaware why they're doing that particular thing? And it just happens to cast it into some form just as the perceiver does. So I might see someone, I don't know, painting a picture and I would say, oh, that's an artist painting a picture and he's painting a picture of this or whatever. The artist is painting the picture and also seeing himself painting a picture of something. Are we really in any different positions? Well, on one level, no, we're both human beings casting some experience into a form that we can relate to. Um, does the artist know why he's doing that? Well, if he said he does, he would then have to find out how he knows that. What, how he how he is how he has found the true purpose behind his art? How would he discover that? I've not been able to find a true purpose behind anything I do. <laughs> um, so um, uh, I, I, I I may be um, I may be alone in this, or maybe others can tell me how they find their true purpose in what they're doing. As far as I see it, whatever I am doing. Uh, I experience a um, like an urge maybe to do something and then it will take a form in my mind of, oh, I'm doing it for this reason or if I do this, this will happen. But I don't, I, they, those two things are different to me. The, the, the impulse to act is not the same as the form we give that impulse. And I don't really see the artist as any different position than the, than the, than the perceiver of the art. So in that sense, uh, we're both in the we're both blind, I think, to what the actual, if there is an actual intent behind the art actually, you know, is, or you know, that that that, that doesn't seem to me to be something that we can get to. Um, so I think the idea of what the artist meant by it is probably more accurately how the artist cast their intent into the form that made sense to them. 
But as they didn't have any free will in the first place to do anything else, then uh, I don't really think that necessarily matters too much. What seems to me to matter more is art seems to me to be about communication of some kind. Um, commu uh, when, when um, f speaking personally, from my, from my um, expression of art, I feel that it is actually in many ways primarily about me discovering something about me. And then I put out what I've done so that other people can experience it. And it might well be that they react to it or they might not. Um, some people react to some of the poems I write in a really strong way. Others, I'll write a poem that I think, wow, that really is, that really has change something in me and other people will look at it and go that's nice and you know <laughs> um so uh, it, it's an interesting thing uh, to me there's this division but or this this distinction between um between what drives us forwards you could say life life force whatever you might call it and how we identify patterns in those behaviors um and I suppose that comes down to what uh, Melinda was saying about why. You know, why do we do this? Why do we do that? Why do we do the other? On one level, I'm not really that interested why, because I think that why will always give me a, uh, a kind of superficial understanding. I think the moment I start asking why I'm doing something, I will never get to the answer because I can't get to it. It's, it's, it's an inaccessible thing. Um, it's like causation that ultimately involves drawing a line under things and saying, well, I'll start there and I'll work my way forwards to create a chain of reasoning. But essentially what you're doing by drawing that line is ignoring everything underneath you and pretending it's not there. So causation kind of is like an incredible simplification of um, what is a phenomenally complicated thing. Roland, I think, you're, sorry, yeah, you're, you're, uh, you're saying that why is a bottomless pit? Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't go anywhere. No, Ultimately, it, it keeps on going it, back. It, I mean, if you're going well, to, I, if yeah, you're going, in if you're going to, if I, you're going to, sorry, if you're going to meet somebody at a certain place at a certain time, and you've got your why because you want to meet that person at a particular place. That's the why. But you're saying, mm. but that, but I've got to go back and back and back and back, and I'll never get to the to the to the the, the origin of that why. And why and why is that important? <laughs> um, yeah, I I, uh, I would say that uh, that's that that that's absolutely right. If you're if you're continually looking for the cause of something, then you have to look for the cause of the cause as well, and the cause of the cause of the cause. And you know, you're 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 into infinite regression, as it were. Um, and also, you're working with the generation of knowledge. So the only causes you can actually identify are the patterns that you're capable of recognizing in what's going on anyway. So, and we all know that that changes as we grow. Uh, if you ask a child to recognize. Um, I don't know, um, some complex pattern, like, you know, um, an arrangement of objects, uh, they, they, they might not have a clue what you're talking about because they don't, they don't see that. But as we, as we grow, we can see, we, we start to develop more patterns, but we can still only recognize in the, our experiences, the patterns that we already have a reference for within us. So um, however we happen to, uh, cut up or label the world or our experiences or the intents we have or the thoughts we have, we're always limited by um, the, 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 the capabilities we have for doing that, the capabilities we have for constructing knowledge. And uh, we're also uh, limited by the fact that we can't keep on going infinitely to find causation for things. So um, we will never find out why as a right now i now i know why because it's impossible uh it, the, the, there's there's always got to be a line drawn somewhere 
um, that that we that we we just go well we won't go beyond that. And the only way we I mean uh, your approximation principle, Ron, in your writing really kind of uh, identifies this as uh, how we get on with each other. When I when I say oh yeah Ron we'll we'll meet up at so and so and and have a talk about art. Um, we, we've just created a sort of approximation. We've drawn a line under everything else. We said, well, that's what we're doing. But we don't actually know whether that's what we're doing, really. It just happens to be the way we've labeled our experiences at that moment. And I quite like that idea because it's quite liberating. To me, the idea of actually having to know what I'm doing is incredibly um, restrictive. <laughs> I'd rather not know and find out, like, find out something a bit more later, as it were. <laughs> Correct. So, but then, <laughs> Roland, what, what would be the difference between, or, or how would you define art? I mean, if, if you completely take away the, the, the concept of intention, so would, um, would uh, uh, just a, 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 um, a little uh, uh, thing might, my son did when he was two and I thought it was great because he's my son and just put it on on the wall would be considered a work of art and then putting something when he's 16 and he did this amazing thing and would that would I say look this is the art of my son would you accept the two-year-old unintentional it just it just came, I thought that the colors were amazing, but there was no intention behind that. So would that, I mean, to take completely away the intention or the artist, the, the human there that has an influence on you is uh, very difficult to, um, to uh, uh, disregard, to just put it on the individual perceiver uh, and not think that the perceiver has something to do with how there was how the intention of a different perceiver uh, takes about and makes the art art what it is. Could so, you have a, well, an AI artist making art to be perceived by AI uh, uh, computers? Uh, who are going to be the ones to judge whether it's good art or not, and no humans involved at all. Isn't that what a network is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, can, I, can I just take your point up, Debbie? Um, yeah, I think uh, we're into deep water here because on the one hand, what I'm suggesting appears to be solipsism, but I don't think it is. Um, and uh, I do think there is a connection between people which is not visible um, necessarily on the surface. In fact, I know there is from my own point of view, but I don't want to get into that right now. But what I do feel is that it, when you ask, well, what is art? I think that's a very hard question uh, because <laughs> what else is there apart from art? I suppose you could say, is there anything else? Yeah. I mean, uh, what's, the, what's, the, uh, what's, what's not art? That's, to, my, to my mind, it's uh, about influence. This, that's why I Lars, said, as someone, I said, we're not going to discuss be. what art is could because be. we will be at it all night. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's 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 a, that's mean, another bottomless pit. That that uh, glass, when you pick it up, is not art. But if somebody drew it, it would be art. But we don't want to go into that now because we'd be in a, or in a, a toilet a, in a yeah in a museum. <laughs> Well, can I can I just say one thing? Um, I um, I'm very interested in how we react to objects, and uh, um, uh, we if you go into your house, look around your house, look around anyone's house, you'll see that it's littered with usually with objects that have significance and relevance to the person or people who live there. And every time you look at those objects, they they are um, they have an impact. So that essentially one's home is a ritual space, which is filled with objects that resonate with the things that make your life, you know, worthwhile. And oh, also, 
or hell. Uh, you know, the other thing is hell. Yeah, you know, when you go to your office and see the pile of papers, that, that's you know a different type of reaction. <laughs> but basically, uh, objects are charged. You could say with um, with influence on us. Every time we we plug into them with our attention, uh, we get this stream of conscious uh, of consciousness from them. You could say, and um, uh, that that object will then have an effect. And it can be the most trivial object that can be charged with that kind of energy. Something that someone else would pick up and go, well, that's just rubbish. Um, and uh, I mean, uh, uh, this place I'm in at the moment belongs to an artist that I bought this about a year ago. And uh, he he was a very interesting guy, but all of the, the, the place was filled with what looked to me like junk. Uh, but he would pick up this sort of beaten up, woodworm infested um, piece of furniture that barely held together. And you could see on his face, he'd like be transported back to that moment when, you know, his granny gave it to him and that day, you know, whatever it was. And so that lump of, you know, firewood, <laughs> from my point of view, was meaningful. And I think this is an amazing thing about about objects that we can we 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 can charge objects with influence, and uh, or we can actually to interrupt you just a second. Or it, objects can charge us. Uh, yeah, in 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 the sense that we are influenced by those objects, and therefore we are changed by those objects. And I think that's. Um, that's one of the, re you know, as I said, I, th I think we can see that from ourselves by just standing in our living rooms and looking around. And you will see ar around your living room, almost certainly, many objects uh, that will influence you in particular ways. Not just objects as well, but also colorings, wallpapers, furnishings, curtains, whatever. They will all be irradiating you with influence. <laughs> so who is to say that this is art or not? I don't know. I don't know. To my mind, it's I'm looking about at Dan's influence. picture here. Dan's uh, photo on the screen with all the records behind you. And I wonder, Dan, you must have music in your world. <laughs> and, and so we look, as Roland was just saying, look, let, let's look around the room. What is the influence? of these objects why is dan sitting in front of these objects what is the the communication that's happening um, that tells us something about dan unless he's sitting in somebody else's apartment like you are roland which has pieces of trash that are inspirational beauty so i'd love to hear dan say something about that if i may ask you to yeah, it's actually it's it's someone else's art. It's a it's a representation. It's what other people have uh, accomplished and 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 shared with me. So it's it's pretty simple. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, it's it's artists that I've worked with who have done artistic work and been rewarded for it, awarded for it. Um, and they represent the amount of people that have bought their albums. And, and may I, I ask, what, yeah. how, how come they gave it to you? Because I, uh, I, I represent them. I book their, book their touring. Okay. So you so, facilitate yeah. the creation of I'm art by artists, enough. right? Yeah. Which in itself, I mean, you do the communication. So communication, we all know, because we're doing it right now, is one of the arts the arts of being able to express something that actually moves somebody. Um, and so these, these uh, artists behind you are, you're both inspirational to them. You afford them the opportunity to communicate in the ways that they communicate and they recognize that and reward you quote unquote for that. They acknowledge the value that you bring to the communicational aspect. So Roland, to your points about, mm -hmm. you know, how we experience that, and Terry, Terry too, from your scientific points of view, 
Um, all of these, these methodologies combine in this uh, thing that we're exploring, which is why do we care to express what is conscious or unconscious in a way that communicates to others? So I, I don't really think the question of, of what is art is relevant so much as why is art? Why do we want to do this? You know, uh, Terry and I are having this side conversation about mirror neurons and the, the effect of um, bio, uh, bio um, uh, science in affording humans and other sentients communication pathways. So, so it's a, to me, we will never go down the rabbit hole of the, what is the original, because the original is always inspired by something. So really the question is what inspires us? And that's a very different answer for lots of different people. Um, and, and Debbie brought up the children, you know, our children aren't educated artists, but they have a, uh, children, I think the world over have a desire to express in drawing or dancing or sound. Are they doing art? something? Oh. Yeah, they, that's, are that's they doing the art? Well, and what is art uh, but a creation of something different than what was before? Um, and even a copy is a creation of something different from what was before. Um, and the question is, what is important to us in our backgrounds? Um, and which is why it's fascinating to me to be, you know, kind of a uh, Yankee over here, um, you know, um, to realize that most of the people on this screen have such a different uh, background than I, even though we speak kind of the same language. Um, just because we are raised, raised in different realities, you know? Um, and, and I think that that's another thing that art does is it helps us to experience other realities and somehow that is pleasing. Um, and uh, Terry, I see you nodding, somehow that's important too. So, so I'd love for, for Terry, you to join into this on the, the scientific side too. And Dan, I, you know, I think you expressed that it's not just the artist who creates, it's, it's the energies around the artist, i.e. people. God, I wish I had, you know, somebody like you when I was be, touring, a touring musician. Yeah, but I never did, so I did it myself, which was fine. But you know, it, 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 um, patronage—that whole idea of patronage, which enables a person to actually live, um, eat, have a place to to be warm, and spend their time creating, um, rather than producing goods. On the other hand, no civilization seems to exist without art. So arts are some kind of commodity. They are some kind of necessary commodity of life. Okay, I'll stop talking again. Uh, this, <laughs> Terry, Dan, this, people. They, they, they want to. Frank had his hand up. I was wondering maybe Frank hasn't had a chance to talk yet. Yeah, for, no, he did. Well, uh, for, before we get to Frank, I just want to ask. Melinda, what do you think then of my blank wall behind me? <laughs> you have room for albums. Okay, that was a facetious Potential. question. Potential. Oh, okay. I accept that. You, you don't know what's up here, though. <laughs> okay, um, Frank. Uh, I just wanted to say, Melinda, I mean, I'm no philosopher, but if you talk about what inspires people, etc., I mean, if we go back to the early caveman and we see the first signs of art, why did they draw those animals, those reindeers and things like that? What inspired them? Probably 
the first of all, it was man using his and woman using his imagination. Secondly, the potential of being able to create something, and thirdly, the hope that will buy drawing a reindeer or other objects, something would happen in nature that would improve his quality of life. Perhaps the rain would come, perhaps there'd be animals, perhaps he just loved drawing animals. Perhaps we're looking too deeply into this sort of thing, what inspires people. And surely it's part of the human condition to create. We create, we have imagination. Those are probably one of the greatest virtues or qualities we have our ability to imagine and create things. Secondly, I'd like to say, it seems to me that all this business of the original and the copies and the, the copy seems to be getting a bad press tonight. What I'm saying is you're sort of denigrating it and seeing it as something inferior to the original. But I'd like to stress the fact that our entire Western heritage and culture is based entirely on copy. Everything which has come through to us from the early Greeks through to the Islamic world, through to the early Latin world up to the present day were all based on copy. And therefore, everything we know and have is based on copy. The question is, uh, how far back do we have to go to want to see the, the origin of these copies? It's virtually impossible. I'll give you an example. The Bible. Take the Bible. If you look in the New Testament, you take the fourth book of John, St. John. The book opens with the word Logos. Now, for generations, people have been translating the Bible into the vernacular, into various languages. And what do they translate Logos for? The word. But if you go to the university of somebody who understands Greek, they'll say it's a load of rubbish. The word logos doesn't mean the word. It means a discussion. Now that could change the whole, the whole idea, the whole understanding. So I'm saying this, this business of origin, of translations and everything, somehow it, we get lost with it, but it also creates a heritage, a culture. There's a loss and gain through it all, and that's part of civilization, Western civilization. That's what I have to say. Quite right. Um, I just, I just want to say that um, I, I mentioned that the problem of origin. I think Roland brought that up. Is, 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 is a very strange thing, because there is no origin. If everything is translation or a metaphor, or every word we use is uh, something that has so many meanings and that um, the fact that we understand each other is because we accept uh, the meaning in a very general way. As soon as, we, as soon as we say, what do you mean by that word? We start di discussing things and arguing. The point is that we get along. We're all from, we're from different countries here and different languages possibly. And yet we understand each other because we are talking approximately. The, 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 the language is all approximate. And to say that there is an origin of what any one of us is saying uh, brings us back to what Roland says. We have to go back and back and back. And eventually we won't agree at all. I mean, if, we, if we ask what did the word mean uh, originally, we'll find something completely different as uh, Frank just, just mentioned. So. Um, does, I, it, does it matter though? Does it matter the origin? Um, does it matter? No. On the other hand, on the other hand, it does matter if we want to say that the uh, origins don't matter. Then it then it matters. Can I bring up the idea of the vision? I think uh, one problem with this, what vision. you're saying though is one second, Melinda. Go ahead. No, I was Richard. I was just saying that. Um, Mm -hmm. Oh, to go back to Kant, uh, which uh, Ron, whom Ron mentioned, and I'm paraphrasing because it's about 40 years at least since I've read Kant, but he said something about it's not the view from the mountain that's sublime, it's the occasion of sublimity in the mind of the viewer. And mm -hmm. with every artist, poet, musician, there is an occasion 
where they wish to communicate a vision of the world that they have seen. Um, now, other people can copy it and say, in the case of jazz, uh, might actually make something new that is better. In the case of poetry, you can get plagiarists who copy something, say, in America and win a prize in England where it hasn't been seen or in Australia or change over the countries as you like. But you find a lesser known poem and you change it a few words. Now, I would object if it was my one of my poems, and I su suspect Roland would too, because although you don't really mind how they're used, you do object to someone else then claiming something that is your work. Um, and if, say, you're T.S. Eliot or James Joyce, and you change the way that people see the world, okay, it may not be directly from James Joyce, it may not be directly be from T.S. Eliot, but it is from people who've been influenced by them, then they are the people who had that vision. And it's always artistic vision. And that's why originality is important. Everything else is cliche. There have been, oh, um, sorry. I think we're leaving out one thing though, is that we're, we're, we're certainly valorizing this idea of thought and original thought. Um, so what Richard, you're referring to, and I, and I agree, we shouldn't plagiarize, um, but everything is referential. Um, yeah, and that's the that. use of epigrams, uh, epigraphs. That's, that's why we say, you know, the inspiration came from X um, and try not to use the actual words of some, someone else's creation. But I think we're, we're, we're really um, elevating thought above emotion. And I think one of the things that we're leaving out here is that art is an emotional response. Um, it's, not, it's not that the artist is necessarily trying to express a thought. It's that the artist is trying to express a feeling or the artist is, is doing a feeling. Um, I, I believe, and I, I am no Greek scholar, but I believe the word drama. The suspense is killing us. <laughs> As I leave you all hanging, the, yeah. word, the word drama, I believe, is where I was. Um, I believe in Greek is from, the, from what we think of as to do to do something. It's not to think about something. It's not to reflect on something. It is to do it. Um, and I think that, that when we were talking about cave art, you know, why were they doing that? We left out this thing called gratitude. I think that it's highly possible that original sentient beings were grateful that there were animals that they could catch and eat. And we're expressing, you know, some sense of beyond themselves, which eventually we labeled God, um, uh, of these, these powers or entities. Um, someone else said, why do we read Harry Potter? Well, it's magic. It's magic. And we leave out the magic. And I believe that science is the exploration of what we first perceive of as magic. And then we ask ourselves, Terry, tell me that if that makes any resonance with you, we ask ourselves, well, why is this? Why is this abstract thing like jazz? Why does it have an emotional impact that you don't have to explain? So you guys are all philosophers um, and I, I'm sure that that doesn't sit well with, with uh, the philosophic school of thought of, of explaining the why of all. But I, I think of it as the feeling of all um, and how humans and sentience, any sentient, experiences the feeling of something. But, so um, I'll shut I, up again. No, 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 it's fine. May, may I say something? I haven't got my hand up though, but I take it as given. Um, I, I, I think that the problem of feeling is a huge problem 
because we don't know where that is. I mean, we know where it is in the brain, but the, the brain where it is because it lights up, mm -hmm. but the conversion of that thing in the brain to the actual uh, mystical, I don't like the word, but the feeling, we just don't know how that works. Still today in the 21st century, we do not know, we know where the neurons are, we, we see them moving, see them flashing, but, but the feeling, the feeling of joy, the, the memory itself, we don't know how that's converted. And that's still the problem. So when Melinda, you talk about feelings, et cetera, et cetera and uh, neurons, I, I, I don't know how to, I don't know what to do with it because I know where they, where they are. And I don't know if I ask why, or maybe ask what, but we still haven't got it. We don't well, know. Well, musicians how... know what to do with it though, because well, they've spent their time studying that. You've spent your time <clears throat> studying thinking. Well, musicians have spent their time studying doing. It's not, that's not the point. I, I also play an instrument. Okay. But, but um, I, I, I don't, I don't, I know when I feel that it's working, I feel good. And I know. So I you feel, feel it. Yes, yes, but that's not the point. I, I know that if I was in an MRI machine, they would see where it's lighting up in my brain. Right. But they would not know the conversion between that physical and my emotional feeling. We haven't got that yet, but I agree. Right. I, I feel it. Of course, people feel. I don't deny people feel. But where, how does that work? We, we're, far, we're far from knowing that. Can I introduce right. you entirely? Sure, I think uh, uh, you're talking about feelings. Uh, I'm not a philosopher uh, or a poet or an artist. I'm a dentist. And mm -hmm. I have a, a great Ouch. deal of contact. I felt that. I have a great <laughs> deal of contact. I have a great deal of contact with pain. And I want to point out to you that I can cancel out pain by using a local anesthetic. I can, I can uh, stop the pain. I can cease it affecting the brain. And if only I had... Uh, the equivalent of a local anaesthetic that could do the same thing for anger or could do the same thing for jealousy, then perhaps I, we, I would be able to advance our world a little further. I don't know why feelings should be any more important than hunger, uh, than, than pain, than other similar feelings which we don't regard as emotions. And why doesn't art uh, involve itself with uh, pain. Why doesn't art involve itself with hunger or thirst? Uh, it could just as easily do that. I find God was in pain when he painted. Uh, okay. Uh, I, his pain wasn't physical. It was perhaps uh, it yeah, was yeah, uh, physical pain. Yeah. Uh, no. Cut off his ear. Uh, I think he didn't have the pain till he cut it off. But all right. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder. Could I have a shot at um, addressing something that Melinda was asking? This question about this bottomless pit of why. I have, a, I have an idea that I think is at least interesting. Um, it seems to me that life is, um, or a prerequisite to life is self-organization. So um, uh, we are all self-organizing systems. Um, we have the ability apparently to pursue intents even though we might not know what they are we can certainly pursue the intent of remaining alive and doing lots of different things now how can we do that without having certain uh um i don't know capabilities inherently in our in our um in our systems um so one of, those, one of those capabilities has to be self-organization. We have to be able to confront experiences that come to us and to either protect ourselves from them or integrate those experiences into new learning. If we didn't have those abilities, we would be ripped apart in seconds and cease to be able to do anything. So it seems to me that the, the, one of the main properties of any resilient uh, system that has duration and apparently pursues intent is the ability uh, to self-organize at a very, very high and efficient level. Um, now, um, 
why what is pretty obvious amongst civilizations tribes families whatever is that um self-organization is also happening on those levels and it seems to me that that uh, that type of organization can only happen if there's an interchange of information on many 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 different levels um possibly because we are a bit preoccupied with our heads uh we perhaps overlook how superficial thinking is compared with other processes going on. Like for example, I can stand up from my chair and I can say that in two words, three words, I'll stand up. But the actual processes going on that enable my body to organize itself into that movement are phenomenal, absolutely amazing. You could spend a, 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 a lifetime studying that single process of standing up and still not get to the bottom of it because the amount of coordination and sophistication that's going on in our bodies over that over just that movement is utterly bewildering so um, we can see that as we think about things we are actually operating on an incredibly superficial level where much of the detail of what's going on you could say is stripped out um, so um, it's reasonable to say that our capability for self-organization is far, far, far more complex than our heads can get to. We can also um, reasonably expect that the information being transmitted around our bodies, the means, the method by which feedback loops are generated, hierarchical systems of feedback is operating, are also way more sophisticated than we can get our heads around. And that the type of information being transferred may well be of a character that, our, that is nothing like thought. And uh, when we talk about feelings, I'm, uh, I'm thinking to myself that this is that feeling is something around the systemic experience of integrity um, and different types of integrity going on in a, in a, in a system. Um, as we start to expand out of the body and into different individuals, surely we are using many, many different types of communication and uh, um, transfer of information between our fellow humans in order to maintain integrity at a bigger level. So not merely as bodies, but as families, as relationships, as tribes, as civilizations. And the fabric of that transmission of information has got to appear in multiple forms, not just in words and thought. And it seems to me that art is one of those methods of transmission, not just art, um, but other things, many other things as well. Simply sitting down at a table and eating food is, contains so much information uh, that it's unbelievable. Um, telling someone a story uh, is not merely a matter of reading words, it's emotional content, body language, all this stuff is going on. So I don't think we would, I, I can't be in the least surprised to find that part of the fabric of maintaining systemic integrity amongst human beings would include um, uh, activities which are non-verbal and uh, um, are, uh, ha have evolved to create influence of different kinds on the people in that society, in, in, that, in that structure. So I would say that art, if we are to sort of try and pin it down at all, is something to do with that, something to do with uh, the self-organization of human systems. And um, uh, yeah, I'll stop there. And communities. Yeah. yeah. It's human systems on all levels. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But Roland, yeah. isn't there um, intention behind that? And if there is, I mean, if, I mean, isn't there intention behind influence? I mean, or perhaps we, we can't use language to say what you want to say, because influence does have within the term cause and effect. Uh, so whether the cause was intentional, uh, it's different than whether it was if I just knocked over this glass I just uh, uh, showed you, but I had no intention to do it, uh, is different 
in the instance that I did, and I think especially in art, um, to see it, um, the way you um, uh, uh, defined or not defined or uh, described what art is, um, it is very difficult to not put the artist. Uh, it is, um, I'm trying to get out of the solipsism that I take um, uh, your theory, despite also knowing, no, perhaps it, I understand it's not solipsis, a solipsis. You're not a solipsist. You're saying, yeah, there is an artist behind the creation of art, but he is not relevant to <laughs> the way I perceive this piece of art. Could I just say something there? He, he could yeah. well be relevant. <clears throat> but what I would say is that it's a bit like the storyteller. Uh, the storyteller, one of the functions of the storyteller is to provide metaphors for, um, for uh, well, for example, if you're telling stories to children, to provide metaphors for children to start understanding the complexity of uh, social interaction between humans. Um, we have Aesop's fables and all the rest of it. And of course, storytelling is an incredible skill which some people can develop in the, spontaneously in the moment in a crowd of people and tie together all sorts of interesting issues that are going on. Well, the artist is surely in a similar- I, I, I want to go back to Maurice's story. idea because it ties into what Debbie and Roland just said. So the idea of um, reducing pain is a hugely relevant idea of communication. And what are we trying to do with kids? Uh, Winnie the Pooh, to me, one of the great pieces of phil ph philosophical writing for children to reduce their pain and fear of the world, of being different, of not fitting in, I would say that um, that pain is a symptom of systemic disintegration, and it happens on all sorts of different levels. So pain, I don't see as a bad thing. Pain is actually informative. It's a symptom, um, pain and we seek is to alleviate creation. Why? Why did the cave art, as Maurice asked, why did why did people in the earliest days go into cave and do art? And I suggested gratitude. And I also suggest that it's a reduction of pain. The pain of not finding food is relieved when food is found and shared in the community. And so I think what we're really talking at a very high level here is how do we have compassion and, and express compassion in community. Also, I think Frank, you raised the idea of, of, um, of the translation idea uh, and what um, what the word actually means in in the Greek translation. Well, art, in a way, bypasses translation and goes into experience. Um, and so, I think the the um, the approach of doing public art is the inspiration, the in-breathing, and the, the reduction of pain and the sense of inclusiveness and not being alone is the result. Um, many artists know you disagree. Go ahead, Ben. In medieval art, it increases the pain. When people went into the church and they saw the picture of hell and what happened to you, Rita, they were in yeah. constant fear and anxiety. Constant and fear and anxiety. Was, what is going to happen to my soul when I die? Am I going to be roasted and tortured yeah. to death? So pay, you know, Whereas in the Buddhist traditions, the idea is about. not to create fear. Carry on. Your turn. I missed that. Melinda, yeah. 
I, I missed what you last said. I said that it depends on the period and on the, on the intention of using art. Art can be used as a, as a wonderful expression as something very positive, but art can also be used to be calm here. I, uh, I, I, need, I need to say something now. I got my hand up. Um, the, the notion that, um, that, that art is something that uh, stops pain and makes you feel good it, it, it is not um, part of reality of a lot of art. Um, I never my uh, medieval art definitely, but in the 1960s, there was a lot of pain that was uh, brought out in art. And I want to mention uh, Ad Reinhardt in, the in 1960, who painted a lot of black squares. And he and he did and he and he did and he did that because he wanted to get to the basis of art, i.e., to the basis of existence. And he reckoned if he took away as much as possible, and he got to a black square, he will he that is the essence. Now he did this black square for five years. He painted black squares, right? Believe it or not, he committed suicide at the end. He did not get to the essence, and he knew it. But what he wanted to get to was, uh, was, was nothing. He wanted to get to, he wanted to get rid of everything, and he didn't. He couldn't because he couldn't get rid of himself. And when he, when he did get rid of himself, uh, hang on, you lot, <laughs> hang on. When he did get rid of himself. He literally got rid of himself. Now, the, 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 that is pain, pure pain. And what he, what he wanted to do was to get to the essence. And, and, and possibly artists do want to get to the essence, and they can't do it. And that is painful. That's not joy. That's pain. And, um, and, and, and this is shown again and again. There's the scream and there and um it, it, it's it's quite it's quite amazing that uh, people talk about the joy when 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 you want to get down to the es essence you get down to pain and to to nothing and and i think that if we talk about art we need to talk about that as well without wrapping it up in all this beautiful stuff because some of it is not beautiful and i'm sure I'm sure that artists feel a lot of pain when they're trying to get out their their art. I just wanted to mention that because because I think it, I think it, I'm, we're not talking about medieval. We're talking about the 1960s, and there was so much of that. Um, by the way, when I when I went when I was writing about that in my nothing book, I went to MoMA in New York, and I saw and I went and stood in front of Ad Reinhardt's black black square. And I was stood there in wonder. And I was stunned by the fact it wasn't black. And, and, and I looked closely at it and I saw that there were, there were hues in there. It was not black. I thought to myself, I've been fooled because everybody's been telling me and he's been telling me and he, and he wrote about it, that he's looking for the, for the, for the, the basis and it wasn't. In other words, for five years, he'd been painting black squares, each one different to all the others. Now, that struck me and gave me a blow because I didn't know anymore what to think. And I couldn't ask him because he was gone. Thank you. You've always, you've always said, Ron, what is black to somebody might be brown to another person. Um, Ron, Ron, could I reply to, oh, Melinda's gone. I was trying to reply before. Melinda, are you still there? No. Oops. She asked me a question a long time ago and I kept trying to answer it, but. She, um, she's really gone now. Yeah, she's gone, gone. Oh, that's too bad. No, she'll be uh, back. Okay. Uh, no, I think she was gone, gone. Gone, gone? Do you yeah, yeah she said goodbye. Well, with that, I'm going to depart also. So it's been very good uh, hearing all of you.
Uh, yeah, you know, it's good to see everybody again. So, uh, uh, so. I, I just, I just got to tell you that I did about a third of what I wanted to do. The next bit was going to be about crypto art, which would have, you would have loved, Terry. About it's what? Crypto art. Crypto art? Yeah, which is AI and NFT, but never mind. I won't do it now. Everybody is tired. May, maybe another, an, another time. Uh, it's um, very, very in interesting art that does not exist in um, physical terms, but is something that's sold from one time. It's very interesting, but I won't hold you up, but I'll, I will tell you another time. I've got lots left, believe it or not. But anyway, you all want to go, that's fine. So um, I just, I do want to leave you with, with one sentence. Ah, yes. Ah. Okay, this is from Richard Feynman. I would rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. And so I wish you adieu. I enjoyed it very much. And I'll uh, see you next time, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye.